Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, okay, so I'd like to start off by honoring and acknowledging that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many uh, nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. I'm joining you today from Fort Francis, Ontario, which is in, situated in Treaty 3 territory and is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Métis people, where it's been my great pr uh, privilege to live, work, and learn for the past 23 years. In this virtual space, we're all convening from different places, and this is one of the things that makes the online environment very special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in our chat. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the nine Indigenous institutes operating in the province of Ontario. Uh, as an essential part of the post-secondary system in the province, Indigenous institutes are Indigenous-governed and operated institutions that provide opportunities for students to start and complete post-secondary education credentials in a flexible, personalized, and culturally responsive learning environment. The Indigenous institutes also provide high, high school programs, continuing education courses, literacy and basic skills training, and Indigenous language revitalization programs. I encourage everyone to find out a little bit more about the great work being accomplished by Ontario's Indigenous Institutes. You can access, access all of the websites that are on the screen right now by visiting the link that's being posted in the chat. And in addition to that, we're posting another resource link where you can explore uh, issues around land acknowledgements as well as treaty uh, territories across North America. So I encourage you to check out those resources when you have the opportunity. So hello everyone and welcome to eCampus Ontario's webinar on adaptive learning, how to assess adaptive teaching and learning tools. My name is Don Eldridge and I'm a program manager uh, on the programs and services team here at eCampus. I also would like to acknowledge my colleague uh, Spencer who is monitoring the chat and my colleague Lutfia who, uh, from our communications team who helps make all of these uh, webinars possible. So thank you both for attending. Uh, also joining Joining us today is Dr. Banafshe Karmafar, who is Senior Analyst, Strategic Research and Impact Evaluation in Higher Education for the Office of the Vice Provost Academic Affairs and Teaching and Learning Support Services at the University of Ottawa. Also joining us from the University of Ottawa is Dr. Edmund Zahidi, who is a lead analyst, curriculum and learning outcomes, working for the Office of the Vice Provost Academic Affairs, the Teaching and Learning Support Services, and the Program Evaluation Office. So I welcome you both and thank you for joining us here today. So to provide just a little bit of context, adaptive learning platforms are educational technologies that assess a learner's knowledge identify skills gaps, and provide a personalized instructional path towards learning outcomes. eCampus Ontario has been working in the adaptive learning space for the past several years, where we see these technologies as an important and emerging part of the digital transformation of higher education. With recent advances in artificial intelligence, we can expect these kinds of technologies to quickly evolve with far-reaching implications on teaching and learning. With this in mind, we have collaborated with Dr. Karmafar and Dr. Zahidi to deliver a three-part webinar on how to select, implement, and evaluate adaptive teaching and learning systems. We offered the first two parts of the webinar series back in the spring. Uh, in part one of the series, we looked at the functionality of common adaptive learning platforms and how you can assess your needs when selecting a system. Then in part two, we examined learning theories that supported the use of adaptive learning and the role of AI and algorithms in adaptive learning, along with the challenges and the biases that these can present. Uh, links to the uh, recordings from these part, from parts one and two of our webinars will be provided to you at the end of the presentation today. So today in part three, we are going to examine how best to evaluate adaptive learning systems. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and turn things over to Banif Shea and Edmund to uh, take us through their presentation. 
and over to you. Thank you very much, Don. So I will be uh, the clicker here today for myself and uh, for Banafshe. So just uh, let me know when you have the screen. You are coming through perfectly. Okay, uh, welcome to this presentation. My name is Edmond Zahidi, and I will go over the first section of this presentation. Then I will pass the floor to Banafshe. Uh, to put together the ideas in this presentation, we have benefited from the collective wisdom of our colleagues at the Teaching and Learning Support Services. We would like to acknowledge here the fruitful discussions that we had with David McDonald and Sylvie Cote, both senior specialists active in the educational development and digital learning space at the University of Ottawa. This presentation is the third and last presentation in a series of three. In our first presentation, we ask ourselves, what are the key functions that stakeholders expect from an adaptive teaching and learning system in higher education? In our second presentation, we approach the problem from another angle by asking ourselves, what knowledge, pedagogy, and learning models do we expect adaptive teaching and learning systems to implement? Finally, in this last presentation, we'd like to present some of the key criteria to be considered when selecting an adaptive teaching and learning system. We would like to look at this information as enabler, enables, enabler sorry, of educational institutes for the selection of AI-based tools, tools that are pro proliferating at a tremendous speed. Uh, to put things into their proper context and present the main ideas to those who may not have attended our previous presentations, we will start by a very quick recap of presentations one and two. Then we'll get to the core of this last presentation, namely presenting the evaluation criteria. Please feel free to share your questions and comments using the Q&A or chat function in the webinar platform. We will do our best to address these in the last section of the presentation. If we sketch the level of engagement versus the level of effort, one may get a curve more or less like the one depicted in the blue color on this slide. The x-axis represents the level of effort learners need to put into their learning activity. This could be a combination of the level of difficulty, level of complexity, challenge, and or personal time that it, that it would be required. These factors depend themselves on the quality of the material, the instructional approaches, all conditioned by the uh, professor or facilitator of the course. The y-axis represents the level of engagement. Naturally, we expect that engagement unlocks high-impact learning. Therefore, we aim at maximizing engagement. The beauty of this curve is that it shows a problem well known by all educators. If the effort level is too low for a particular learner, the learner can get bored, hence demotivated to continue learning. On the other extreme, if the effort level is too high for the learner, he or she can get frustrated, hence again discouraged. Then the result would be the same and the, the learner may not fully benefit from the learning activities. These general behaviors are especially true for adult learners, but they may as well apply to younger learners. Clearly, there is an optimum point when engagement is maximized. We all know it when we hit the sweet spot in our class. Our learners feel that they were challenged just the right amount. They leave our class in a happy state and more importantly, look forward to the next session. There's a whole theory behind this behavior very much related to the zone of proximal development theory developed and proposed by, by Gotsky. In theory, the solution to maximize learning would be for a professor to position the class at the optimum point. But there's a small problem here. The fact is that human beings are very different one from each other. And in a classroom of 30 learners, you may end up with so many different personality traits. In general, five different personality traits seem to drive most of the learners depicted in this slide. You may have, for example, learners who have self-discipline and are well-organized, act very responsibly and possess a strong sense of duty and those who have not this trait or have much less of it. 
Now let's go back to our optimum level of engagement diagram and see the effect of the variability in learners on the optimum point of engagement. Here, a hypothetical case for two learners with two different zones of proximal development is shown. It is clear that the needs of these learners are different. Hence, their optimum point of engagement will be different. Therefore, if you try to optimize engagement for one learner, you may lose the other one, an eternal problem for all educators. The zone of proximal development aspect touch only on one perspective, but other perspective models need to be considered as well. This is why besides the pedagogy model, we also considered the knowledge model, the learner model, and the machine learning models in our second presentation. Due to the complexity of the task at hand, and with so many models and aspects, we proposed a students and professors centered approach based on what we think are the needs of our stakeholders. By putting students and professors or educators, if you will, at the center of the universe, we proposed eight critical functions. These eight functions would allow seamless interaction with the educational ecosystem in such a way that learning could occur at the optimum point of engagement for each learner. One important condition that we incl included was called validation and curation. We submit that as the subject matter expert, the educator or the professor has ultimate authority over all instructional activities, especially ultimate responsibility over the what. This does not mean that students do not exert any control. On the opposite, in such a system, students do have control over their learning journey, but the responsibility of the material will always be with the professor. In other words, we call for a co-creationist approach with the active participation by both students and professors, but with well-defined roles and responsibilities. When we did our first presentation, you told us by a poll that personalized tutoring is super critical. We're so happy that you agreed that this function is in fact the raison d'etre or the heart of the whole system. This function takes inputs from so many sources. So you have pre-assessment and learning styles, students' voice, student progress monitor, course learning outcomes, formative assessments, summative assessments, to name a few, and adjust the content and activities to cater for the needs of each student. In other words, the system operates at the optimum point for all students all the time. Please note that the availability of technology has allowed us to make such bold claims. Indeed, as early as 1984, Bloom found that the average student performance on the tutoring was about two standard deviations above the average of the control class control meaning conventional approach. Now it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Banafshi for her to talk about the proposed evaluation criteria. Banafshi, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Edmo. Hello, everyone. So um, in the third presentation, um, uh, we are interested to answer to this question, what are the key criteria to be considered when selecting an adaptive teaching and learning system? Um, next slide, please. So uh, first, let's see what is evaluation. According to the literature, evaluation of a machine or is the act of measuring or exploring properties of uh, uh, an information system in its planning, development, implementation, or operation. In general, evaluation is widely considered as an important and challenging research issue in the area of adaptive teaching and learning. I would like to begin by highlighting some gaps reported in the literature relating with the evaluation of adaptive systems, particularly the need for an independent understanding of pedagogical characteristics. Uh, several gaps have been identified in the literature, including a lack of impartial design and development evaluation. Most rigorous evaluation 
of commercial software primarily originate from the United States and tend to yield mixed results. This the, uh, there is a weak connection to um, theoretical pedagogical perspectives. There is a need for an independent understanding of pedagogical characteristic on each AI driven adaptive systems and framework that goes beyond technical aspects. Also, there is a need for further exploration of ethical and educational approaches in the application of AI in higher education as we heard a lot about that uh, during uh, uh, last month. Next slide, please. Um, so what have we done and what we are we doing now to build this kind of evaluation grid that support technical, ethical, and educational principles? Our approach is based on a scoping literature review of evaluation criteria of AI-enabled adaptive systems. And currently we have targeted five broad typologies of discourses and evaluation grid on adaptive systems. First type is layered adaptive teaching and uh, learning system evaluation grid. Uh, the layered adaptive teaching, and layer, um, uh, adaptive teaching and learning system suggests a detailed layered evaluation framework and a study on the technical basis of this system especially focusing on adaptivity performance. The second type includes AI-enabled adaptive teaching and learning system. So the, this type emphasizes the AI's contribution to today's adaptive systems and includes social, ethical, and data source evaluation. We have learning analytic evaluation grids. These are closely related to AI's, AI's role and focus on specific functions of learner modeling and adaptivity, uh, suggesting criteria such as the relevance and the usefulness of the presented data and visualization. The fourth group of the article that we have studied are educational technologies framework, which focus on evaluating the integration of technology in education in general. And finally, we also consulted several articles and guidelines from different domains on the ethics of AI, including algorithmic decision-making, peer review process, ethical guidelines for AI, institutional guidelines, government guidelines. And it seems to us, uh, it seems very critical, crucial to us to combine criteria from these five typology for creating an evaluation framework for AI adaptive teaching and learning systems. It, it could fill the gap in pedagogical, educational, and ethical aspects mentioned in previous slides. So in the next couple of slides, um, I will quickly go over, go over some characteristic of these typologies from the literature to then present our suggested evaluation steps. Um, so the fir first, some characteristic of the layered evaluation uh, framework. The layered evaluation framework has been employed since 2000 in the evaluation of adaptive systems from a technical perspective. So it's a very robust um, evaluation framework. So the main assertion of the layered evaluation of adaptive system is that adaptations need to be decomposed and assessed in layers to be effectively evaluated. This approach is all isolates um, isolates uh, stages and elements uh, within the system, evaluating each layer independently and interdependently with other layers. Uh, when I refer to layers, for us, a layer can be, for example, a layer of knowledge model or expert model or layer of learner model, layer of pedagogy model, layer of the user interface, layer of adaptivity, as discussed in the second presentation. Next slide, please. So the majority of the claim in this framework align with our philosophy and objectives for evaluating AI-enabled adaptive systems in higher education. For example, the evaluation framework, this uh, evaluation framework advocates for, na for an early formative and cyclic evaluation process of adaptive systems by experts and users, including instructors, instructional designers, Students, uh, when I when I when I when I when I tell instru instructors that could be also educators or maybe TAs, 
the framework emphasizes the importance of stakeholders' perspectives and participations in evaluation, expert and multiple user evaluations, both process-oriented and component-oriented assessments, use case evaluation, classroom practices, and uh, longitudinal impact evaluation. Next um, slide, please. So in this section, I have uh, included an example of evaluation grid for the adaptivity level, only the adaptivity level, as suggested by uh, Prometheus and all in 2010. The grid outlined various components on adaptivity la layer to be assessed. As you can see on the top of the table, the goals of assessments for each component evaluation criteria and the recommended uh, recommended evaluation methods should be explained i invite you to in consult the entire table after the presentation but for now i'll just walk you through the first row in the first row one of the components to be assessed in this layer is what input data is collected by the system the goal is to evaluate the quality and the raw input data collected the evaluation criteria are based on three principles, accuracy, latency, and sampling rate. So latency refers to the time it takes for the system to react to the user's data during interaction. Sampling rate measure the speed and number of samples the system gathers per second from the user. And as you can see, it involves highly technical aspects. Um, and the suggested evaluation methods includes data meaning, play with the layers, simulated users, cross validations, and heuristics. So I encourage you to explore these methods further in if you are interested. Next slide, please. So the questions and criteria for the AI enabled evaluation framework is slightly differ, differ slightly. So I'm Illustrating this with an example of an evaluation grid designed for adaptive system in health sciences, aiming to provide specific instances for the evaluation uh, criteria in use. Next slide, please. So as you can see, AI-enabled system evaluation criteria can include the object objective of the study, assessing if the system has an ethically justifiable goal. So you see that ethics just enter in evaluation criteria of an adaptive learning here, system here. Uh, for example, can AI contribute to addressing an identified educational pro problem with the aim of reducing the rate of failure or increasing efficacy, improving engagement for each learner as Edmund showed at the beginning of the presentation is one of these goals. Um, other criteria such as data source and integrity, transparency, copyright have been added to the evaluation grid. Internal validity criteria covering reliability and accuracy in predicting student outcomes, as well as the size and the proper property of the trained data and diversity of the training data uh, are another important consideration for effective modeling. Uh, the, uh, the student's um, pathway or learning. External validity criteria <clears throat> comes into play when users interact with the system, assessing AI performance with the new and external data. So just to see if the system works well, if we have new data uh, which are internal in the system. We have performance metrics, uh, which are similar to layered evaluation metrics, include especially, especially efficiency of AI, they determine determine, um, determine if AI makes operation more efficient by increasing, for example, consistency and speed and ability or not. We have safety and quality along with the principles of non-maleficience um, uh, uh, as other factors. And next slide, please. So due to the time constraint, I won't be explaining this slide in detail. I've just included it to provide an example from the same article, which organize, organizes the AI evaluation criteria discussed in previous slide into three phases, development check, deployment check, and uh, discernment check. Next slide, please. 
And sadly, due to time constraint for this presentation, I will be skipping the discussion of learning analytic evaluation grids, which are crucial for our final evaluation framework and current Canadian research in higher education. Uh, however, I encourage you to explore the references I've covered, provided for more information on this topic. We have also at, um, at the research unit of TLSS this uh, coming Friday, a presentation of Dr. Andrew Sowinski on learning Canadian landscape of learning analytics. So I invite you to, uh, to participate in this presentation, uh, which is online and in person. So the last two typologies of evaluation framework educational technologies frameworks and guiding principles or and also guidelines for ethics provide us with relevant guiding principles and educational values uh, which are important for us um, and next slide please so there are many as you know and we as we know everyone and we know that there are many important and insightful educational guidelines and frameworks for the integration of technology in education in the 21st century i've just provided two examples here the emergent guiding principles for stem education which emphasize for example the student's experience the learning community availability and the learner protection as guiding principles of adaptive uh, teaching and learning systems. And rethinking the entwinement between AI and human learning, what capabilities do learner needs for a world with AI? This is another example of guiding principles for learning with AI and by the help of AI. As you can see, uh, principles such as self-regulation, creativity, dialogue, creating knowledge in the network of a human AI, economic values, human capital, um, economic activities, human agency, uh, collectivity and individually choice, key human values are presented as important guiding principles in today's education. Next slide, please. Uh, so, well, uh, this is where we are for now. Uh, all these typologies inspires us to create a six-step peer review evaluation process for deployment of an AI-enabled adaptive systems in higher education, which I will explain in my final slides. Um, so that, and then my final slide, I promise you, it's the next one. So the combination of criteria, uh, 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 yeah. So uh, are you on slides twenty-seven, um, Edmond? Would you like me to go forward? I uh, no before. Uh, I've just uh, yeah no that no that's a good one. Uh, so well, um, um, we aim to provide a robust chronological cyclic standards and a process a processes for peer review evaluation of AI in a enabled adaptive platform and program under institutional directive, considering these typologies. Uh, and this is a working progress, just so I, I would like to emphasize that. So we suggest a series of um, uh, modular and layered evaluation grid for each com and for each component and process of the system, a higher level toolkit for supporting centers for teaching and learning service and other stakeholders in their task of evaluating pedagogical, ethical, social, and technical advantages of advantages and risks of these systems. And ultimately, we would like to. Uh, we, we think that this higher level toolkit will be useful for system designers and algorithm developers to better understand the core expectation of universities and bring their design, development, and implementation project into a responsible alignment with emerging st uh, standards. Next slide, please. So um, what we suggest in our first sketch of six step evaluation process are the following. Step one, need analysis. What exactly is needed is, is the need of the program. Why an AI enabled adaptive teaching and learning platform or application is needed. Maybe we don't need that. How do we understand this need? So it, uh, um, the next we move, if we have the very detailed answer, of this question, we move to the step two, which involves a, a scanning phase of the system. The scanning phase will, will involve more than one person from uh, related departments, faculty, and the teaching and learning service of the institution 
these steps will um, determine whether proceeding to the next step is necessary by ass assessing the alignment of the AI enabled adaptive systems or application tasks with the educational philosophy, values, and learning objectives of the program and the level of the anticipated impact on the experience uh, of professors and students. For this step, it is necessary to gather initial documentations or maybe interview with the wonder uh, on the number of number and type of services to deliberate on the question. And the evaluation is conducted by a committee composed of instructional designer professors, TAs and the students. I'm sharing in the chat, if I can, um, um uh, a document but it's a working work in progress document but maybe it is interesting for you um okay just in in this step two okay perfect um uh, so just it's about the verification phase of the system and to give you an idea of what we are working now on uh, um, questions are not complete maybe we i missed uh, some questions but uh, i didn't find time to add them in the document for today and uh, so i go, so if the step two um, is okay and we have um, uh, the good evaluation of a step two a step three uh, will be the ai and algorithmic decision making policy assessment conducted by a committee of IT and AI and EDI for the risk assessment of uh, components such as privacy, copyright, security. So this step will determine whether going to the next step is necessary or not by checking at the deep level, the alignment of the service with AI policies and legislations regarding ethics, safety, and technical risk of biases. I have some document on that, but it is not very well uh, for sharing, but I would be happy in this question and answer uh, section if you want to show you what we have for now. A step four, detailed system assessment. So the detailed system assessment will be just uh, this is step four and evaluation of the system's capabilities will include that will include a diverse and interdisciplinary evaluation committee. This step will determine whether going to the next step is warranted or not by indicating how the AI system was developed and the capabilities and performance of the system in terms of following game of layers such as user interface, knowledge model, pedagogy model, learner model, learning analytics, adaptive actions. So the layer should be evaluated independently and interdependently. Uh, step five, pilot a use case, use case. So just a, a use case assessment um, that can be done with instructor, designers, professors, TAs, students, AI um, experts and EDI experts. So testing the platform applications in class by uh, users and getting feedback. And the step uh, six, that will be an anticipated impact evaluation report. I placed social and ethical impact and individual cognitive and behavior impact, but I think that we can also add a learning impact report. So we really need to have three well-written report to be sure that we want to implement um, and to go in a larger scale. Yeah, with that tool. So I'm done. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry for the long uh, presentation. And please don't hesitate to comment and ask your question. So we are at the question and answers. I guess that I need to stop sharing. Uh, Don, would you like me to stop sharing and pass this sure. over to you? Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and stop sharing. And then it gives me a better line on uh, all the Perfect. cameras if anyone has a puts up their hand. So uh, I do invite questions uh, from the audience. Uh, if you feel free to raise your hand, we can acknowledge you, you can open your mic and ask the question that way. Uh, to get us started, uh, I did see we do have one uh, question so far in the chat. So I'll 